Hello everyone and welcome to the Hippie Geeks. I may not have mentioned it yet, but among other things, we raise bees. We had four colonies going into winter, but only one of them survived into the spring. Now, when you think of a beehive, you are likely imagining something like this. Several square boxes stacked on top of each other. This is commonly called a Langstroth hive, named after the man who designed it in 1852, Lorenzo Langstroth. It has not changed all that much in the decades since its creation, and has become the standard for beekeepers everywhere. It is popular due to the increased honey production that it allows. A foundation dictates to the bees how large of a cell they can create, and once the frames are full of honey, they can be removed from the hive for harvesting. The end caps of the frame are cut off, allowing the honey to be spun out and collected. The frames can then be placed back into the hive to be refilled by the bees. However, this can be stressful to the bees as the boxes get completely separated to be moved. A full box of honey can weigh anywhere from 30 to 70 pounds, and as such can be hard to work with. When reassembling the hive, it is also hard to avoid killing bees as they tend to wander over any exposed surface. However, there are other options, one of which happens to be the one that we prefer, called a top bar hive. It was created in the 1970s in Africa. It is a more natural approach to beekeeping, as there are no frames for the bees to build on with foundations to guide them. The shape of the hive emulates a naturally hollowed out log, and the bees build a freely hanging comb from top bars that have a ridge to guide the comb into straight lines. The bees build cell sizes as big or as small as they feel they need to be. When you open the hive up, you move a single bar at a time, so it disturbs the hive far less, and also allows you to not kill any bees as long as you are careful. However, you are not able to harvest as much honey. Since there are no frames of honey to be put into a spinner, you actually have to destroy the comb to harvest it. The bees then need to spend energy to remake the comb before they can store honey on that bar again. We do not find that to be a negative, however, as it allows us to remove older comb from the hive that we can then render down into beeswax for candles, balms, and furniture polish. We keep bees because we enjoy having them in our yard, and because we feel that it is important to support a healthy colony of pollinators. We do not treat our hives, and look to promote strong genetics to help them overcome the difficulties that all bees now face. What honey we do collect is strictly extra that the hive doesn't need, as we put the bees' health first. If you have never been around bees, it is easy to be frightened of them. When provoked, they will sting, and it hurts. However, no bee wants to sting you. Unlike wasps or yellow jackets, a honeybee will die after it stings. It is a last ditch effort to repel a threat, usually against an attacker that is threatening their hive. As I am working the hive, you can see the amount of bees that are flying around me. As I get deeper into the hive, there will be more and more of them flying around. Yet even with that, I am not wearing any protective gear. I have to admit I have been stung quite a bit over the last couple of years, and bee stings do not affect me nearly as much as they used to, so I don't fear getting stung anymore. That is not the reason, though. I don't wear protective gear with the bees because I know what they will tolerate. I move slowly, I take my time, and I treat the hive with a great deal of respect. I am careful not to squish any bees, and I use a small amount of smoke occasionally. Smoke interferes with the ability of the bees to communicate, which is mostly by smell. If you do happen to crush a bee or get stung, it releases an alarm hormone which makes the bees considerably more aggressive. If you get stung once, walk away from the hive and wash the area. Any trace of the pheromone will make you considerably more likely to get stung in the same place. Lindsay has no desire to get stung, so she wears her bee jacket whenever we open up a hive like this. If our bees were more aggressive, I would also be wearing one, but in this case it is not necessary. We opened up the hive with the intention of splitting it into our other hive. This colony came through winter very strong, and they have been building up their numbers like crazy. We have had a population explosion of not just workers, but also drones. A hive only produces drones when it feels that they can support the freeloaders. The only function of a male drone is to try to spread the hive's genetics. They do not clean, they do not collect pollen or nectar, and as they don't have a stinger, they can't even defend the hive. Their only reason to exist is to search out a virgin queen to impregnate her. With the numbers that we had hatching, we knew we would soon be creating queen cups in preparation to swarm. When a hive is doing well in the spring, its natural reaction is to swarm. The workers will feed several chosen larvae what is called royal jelly, which triggers the change from a normal worker bee into a queen. They will build each of these possible queens a special elongated cell that we call a queen cup to mature in as the queen is considerably longer than a worker. 
Once these cells are finished, the existing queen will leave the hive with about half of the workers and fly off to create a new colony. That is how bees spread in the wild, and while no one likes to see their bees leave, it is a natural part of beekeeping. We had seen that the hive was building queen cups and knew that a swarm was going to happen within a week. You can do two things in this situation. Allow the bees to swarm, or try to perform a split which was our intention. What happens is you look through the hive and find the existing queen and transfer her into a new hive. You take several bars of brood that has already been laid along with half of the worker bees and some of the honey stores. If you are lucky, the bees will accept the move and start building more comb in the new hive. At that point, you hopefully end up with two strong viable hives. In the old hive, the new queens will start to hatch and one will typically kill the others and take the hive for her own. Several queens can survive though and throw secondary swarms that will shrink your existing hive even further. The queen that will be staying with the hive will rest for a couple of days and then go on her mating flight looking for drones. A queen gathers all of the seed that she will use for her entire life in this one mating flight and once she returns to the hive she will not leave again until it is time to swarm. While our intention was to split the hive, this turned into more of a hive inspection. This hive has somewhere between 50 and 100,000 bees in it, and on some of the bars, the bees were three deep. We simply could not see the comb to check for the queen. The bees looked magnificent. There were no mites to be seen, no withered or crooked wings, no behavior that would lead us to think they were sick in any way. A healthy hive is an impressive and beautiful sight. The outer bars are the storehouse where they keep the honey and pollen. The bars closer to the end are the brood, both worker and drone. You can tell the difference as a drone cell has a large bulging end. The large buggers need more space to grow. If you watch carefully, you can see how gently I am splitting the bars apart and setting them back together. I am always mindful of the bees and making sure that no one gets squished. We were unable to find the queen though, and the hives swarmed the next afternoon. They landed 30 feet up in a cedar several blocks away, so we were unable to collect them and give them a good home. However, we were able to stand in the middle of the swarm as they prepared to leave. It is one of the most magical experiences I've ever had. Thousands and thousands of bees in a coherent cloud, the energy visibly and audibly gathering as they prepare to leave. We were sad to see them go, but hopeful they would find a suitable home and continue to spread their genetics. At this point, we had not seen the queen, so it was time to clean up and get all the bars back in place. I was still searching for the queen, but I knew it was doubtful.
Do any of you folks have bees? We wanted to do them for years before we were actually able to, and it's just as awesome as we were hoping it would be. If this is your first time here on the Hippie Geeks, it would be wonderful to have you subscribe. This channel is all about helping you unleash your life and create a world that you love. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and check back every week for new content. Thanks again, and we will see you on the next one.